We're often taught in school that democracy is one of the best and most important things we have in modern society. The idea of democracy started in Greece, as you probably already know, but when the idea was first tried, it wasn't as obvious as today that it would become such a success. Many people were against it and thought of it as chaotic and stupid. Two of the biggest critics of democracy was Plato and Socrates, arguably the biggest and most respected philosophers of our time. So what's the reason these respected and beloved thinkers were so against it? And is there even another option? In the dialogues of Plato, he described Socrates having a conversation with a fellow Athenian regarding democracy. And he had the perfect analogy ready when arguing democracy with people. Compare society with a ship. If you're sailing across a vast sea, who would you rather be steering the ship? Would it be anyone? Or would it be people who are educated seafarers with years of experience? The people Socrates argued with almost always answered the latter one. Then Socrates asked, Why then do we let just anyone decide who should rule an entire country, which is a lot harder and needs more expertise than a sea vessel? His point is that voting is a skill, and should be taught to the people who are voting. It shouldn't be given to just anyone just as their birthright. They need to know what they're voting for. As Winston Churchill, one of England's prime ministers, allegedly said, The best argument against a democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Socrates continued on this point that a democracy would only ever be as good as the education system is in that country. He used a smart analogy with a candy shop owner and a doctor running against each other in a poll with uneducated people. The candy shop owner says that the doctor is out to hurt you. He gives you disgusting drinks and tells you not to drink or eat whatever you like. He'll never serve you great feasts or give you all the sweets you'd like, like he himself would do. Here Socrates asks us to think. Do you think the doctor would be able to reply effectively here? His answer, somewhere along the lines of, I hurt you and tell you what to do in order to help you, would make the voters mad. They simply wouldn't understand. Socrates even had first-hand experience with the foolish and uneducated voters. In 399 BC, the philosopher was put on trial on what he called fake charges of corrupting the youth of Athens with his lectures. A jury of 500 Athenians was invited to decide if he was guilty or not. The jury decided that he was guilty, by a very small margin, only a few percent. Socrates was put to death by hemlock, which is an extremely deadly plant. The jury executed one of the greatest thinkers of all time, cutting his life short because they voted on a hunch, probably making Socrates hate voting even more, the definition of putting the final nail in the coffin. Before he died, he warned society about the fear-mongering people who would manipulate voters, leading us to the biggest problem of all when it comes to democracy. Demagoguery, which is defined by historian Reinhard Luthen as a politician skilled in oratory, flattery, and invective, evasive in discussing vital issues, promising everything to everybody, appealing to the passions rather than the reasons of the public, and arousing racial, religious, and class prejudice. A man whose lust for power without recourse to principle leads him to seek to become a master of the masses. He has for centuries practiced his profession of man of the people. He is a product of a political tradition nearly as old as Western civilization itself. These demagogues use tactics such as scapegoating, fearmongering, outright lying, personal charisma, promising the impossible, physical intimidation, just to name a few. The most famous one being Adolf Hitler. Even though he was elected democratically, it was only after he was elected that he appointed himself as the sole ruler of Germany. But this is only one. There's also Joseph McCarthy, who was a US senator who made everyone scared of communists, saying that the high places in the United States federal government and military were infested with communists. There is Alcibiades, who was born 450 BC. He convinced the people of Athens to attempt to conquer Sicily during the Peloponnesian War, with disastrous results. He led the Athenian assembly to support making him commander by claiming victory would come easily, appealing to Athenian vanity and appealing to actions and courage over deliberation. Alcibiades' expedition might have succeeded if he had not been denied command by the political maneuvers of his rivals. We could probably sit for an entire hour and list out different demagogues, since they are so prevalent both today and 2000 years ago. 
So we established that democracies are messy, unequal, involve lobbying and other types of corruption. So what can we do? Are there other, better options? There are five that has kind of worked in other parts of the world. First, there's monarchies, where a king or queen rules the kingdom as a sovereign. These kinds of states were all over the world just 300 to 400 years ago, but today are left as remnants of a different time. There are still monarchies around the world, but very few of these countries have their king or queen as sole ruler. They're usually just some sort of mascot for the country. Second, there's dictatorships, the obvious one and the polar opposite to a democracy. This is where just one man rules over the country or state. Dictatorships are very common in countries involved with war, with their rule rarely lasting more than 10 years, before they're either overthrown by their own people or by external forces. Thirdly, we have theocracies, a government by divine guidance or by officials who are regarded as divinely guided. In many theocracies, government leaders are members of the clergy and the state's legal system is based on religious law. Theocracy was very popular during the Middle Ages, especially in Europe where almost every single country was Christian and ruled or at least heavily influenced by the Pope in the Vatican. The only real theocracy surviving today would be the Vatican State which still survives in the heart of Rome, but it could also be argued that countries that mix church and state such as Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan are theocracies. Fourth, there are oligarchies, where only a select few rule the country or state, the word meaning rule of the few. Often these come up when a company in a country becomes way too big, creating a monopoly. Defining an oligarchy is very hard, as countries like Turkey, Iran, China, Russia and even the United States could be argued to be oligarchies. And fifth, a one-party rule which explains itself. One party rules the country and the other parties are illegal. We see this in countries like Russia and China, and this one becomes tricky, because it's hard to pinpoint how good it actually is, since both these countries are doing well economically. And some people even say that these countries are going to be the new superpowers with the emergence of the BRICS nations. So it's in these two countries that we find the only kind of working option we have to democracy. If you want to decide which one is best, you'll probably have to wait another 50 or 100 years. At least historically, the one-party system hasn't lasted for long, but you never know what can change in just a few years. So we understand that democracy could be a really bad idea. But how come every single developed nation is a democracy, and why do so many developing nations fight for democracy? Well, it's because it's the best option we have right now in regards to human progress. Maybe in 100, 200 or even 300 years we'll have something else completely, we just don't know. But one thing we do know is to stop thinking of democracy as some foolproof method to a perfect utopia-like country. It's filled with inequality, poverty and corruption. But it's still the best option we have. Democracies almost never go to war with one another, they have higher standards of living, higher levels of happiness, higher levels of health. The whole world wants to live in a democracy, except maybe a few. We'll see.